If you would take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 1. As this morning we look at verses 9 to 20, and if uh, you're not terribly familiar with how the Bible's laid out, Revelation is the very last book. Number 66 of 66. And we're going to be in the first chapter of that again, looking at verses uh, 9 to 20, and I sure appreciate the choir, and I appreciate the music that has been sung this morning. Some are newer songs, some are songs that have been sung throughout the ages, and what a great reminder of that this Jesus that we sing of has been all through the generations, and we can sing about Him even now, and He means just as much to us now as He ever has. So I'm going to ask you if you would to stand as we honor His Word together. Revelation chapter number 1 again, starting at verse 9, going to the end of the chapter in verse 20. And this is the word of the Lord. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held the seven stars from his mouth, and and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand upon me and said, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. You may be seated. So holidays like this allow us to be able to catch up with folks that we may not have been able to see in a while, whether it's friends or family members, co-workers, neighbors, whatever it may be. And every so often, you know, we have seasons of life where there are these really close friendships, and while you're in the middle of those seasons, you think, well, this is a friendship that's going to last for forever. It's going to be a friendship that's going to last for a good long time. Well, then things happen, you know, you move away, you know, move, move to different states or move to, even to a different city. You may even move to a different neighborhood. And then suddenly you find out that those times where you thought, you know, you're going to be together all the time, well, then all of a sudden you see each other maybe once a week and after a while it's once a month and then once a year. And after a while you realize 10 years has gone by and you're like, my goodness, I haven't seen this person in a while. And then when you finally do catch up, you notice sometimes things end up changing. So there was a friend of mine that I was really close to in college. In fact, he was very helpful for me. I had just had a really bad um, academic chapter, and I moved to this new college, and it it happened to be the college where I graduated from, and I knew this was my last shot. And I was very thankful that I, I ended up getting a roommate. God providentially gave me a roommate that just took me in and introduced me to some folks, and all of a sudden, I was on my way, and, uh, and Palm Beach Atlantic ended up being a very good experience. And I thought, man, this is great. I, I played at the guy's wedding. I, I mean, it was, we, we were really close. And then I moved away, and he moved away, and he got married, and I got married and all that. Well, we ended up catching back up about 10 years later, and a lot had happened. And we were sitting in a room at, uh, at a hospital, because his son was at the hospital. We were sitting in a room, and I remember, you know, just sitting across looking at the table from him, looking, and, uh, hey, how's it going? Oh, good, good. How are you doing? Fine, yeah. 
How's the wife? Everybody, the wife. Um, everybody's good. And I had, well, we, we got divorced and things. Were, oh. And all of a sudden, it started getting to be where it was very awkward. And a, and a meeting that we had been spending months looking forward to, it was like all of a sudden we're sitting there and the meeting was over in 10 minutes. And I haven't, and I haven't talked to him since. I was back in 04. I haven't talked to him since. And that's the way it is sometimes. You know, God gives you friends that may last for a good long time. And honestly, if you have two or three really good close friends that last for a long time, man, you're solid. But, you know, sometimes you may have those friends that are just going to be there for that season. And God provides that, and sometimes that's okay. When I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm seeing John, and John is catching up with, really, in essence, an old friend. We may not know much about this, and in fact, when we're talking about lampstands and robes and sashes and eyes on fire and feet on fire and r swords coming out of your mouth. Again, it feels like something out of Lord of the Rings or something. It's just a bizarre, you're looking at this and it's just a bizarre thing. But I'm hoping as we go through this, what you're going to see is that John, if you look at John, the, the, the first verse that we read from, John, from uh, Revelation 1 verse 9, it says, I, John, your brother, and partner in tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Let me just stop right here. So John was a follower of Jesus when Jesus walked on the earth. Jesus lived on the earth for 33 years. The last three years was his, was his ministry. And most of the gospels that we are talking, when we, when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's a selective biography of, of Jesus' life. And so we're seeing here that John comes up prominently. John was one of the 12 disciples that followed Jesus everywhere. And Jesus was teaching them the whole time because he knew that after he was going to be leaving, they were going to be minding the store and they needed to make sure that they understood what ended up needing to happen. Okay, so when, when we're seeing this here, now Jesus walked on the earth around, you know, from, from zero to 30, 31, 32, 33 AD, depending on how the calendars have shifted, you'll see that. John's writing this at 90, 95 AD. So this is six decades after Jesus ascended back to the Father. And there was a lot that went on. Every time I mention Revelation, i got to mention this. A lot went on. Christianity was not well thought of. It's not well thought of now. really wasn't well thought of then. And John saw all of his other friends, all of his other compadres that were walking along with him and walking along with Jesus, systematically executed by the Roman system. He was the last one left. And it says here that he was on Patmos. Patmos was a, an island out in the middle of the Mediterranean. It was basically a criminal colony, 13 square miles. And he had no one. So put yourself in John's spot. John followed Jesus. He saw Jesus alive. And now for six decades, he has been seeing all of this going on. He's seeing God do amazing things, but he's also seeing his friends systematically executed. He's the last one left. He's an old man by now. Now, what made him continue on? Because he's writing, obviously in the present tense, your brother and partner in the tribulation and in the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. What made him endure? Because th think about this. By the time Jesus came along in his life, there were already about 10 or 11 messianic movements. And what I mean by that is folks that had arisen up as leaders and had gathered a following because they thought this was going to be the guy that was going to get us out from underneath Rome's foot. Rome's foot was on their necks. And this is going to be a guy that's going to fulfill all the promises that we've been hearing about for years and years and years and years. He's finally arrived. Oh, the Roman system killed him. Well, what did they end up doing? Well, they ended up going home. Another guy would rise up. He would get this following. And then, and then the guy would get killed by the Roman system. And they would go home. And this was happening over and over again. And so when we observed Good Friday, it seemed like it was going to be the same thing. Jesus dying on a cross like a criminal, even though he had never been convicted of anything, and yet, they, they, they did, what did the disciples do? Well, the disciples at that point went home. Actually, what they did was they ran and hid. Only the women went to the, the tomb at the time. They needed to finish up the anointing process because Jesus was brought down very quickly from the cross. But here... 
they're, they're, they're hiding. What happened that made them come out of hiding? What happened to make John still be faithful 60 years after the fact? He had not seen Jesus face to face, eyeball to eyeball in 60 years, and yet here he is willingly, well, not willing to recant his faith in Jesus. What made him stick around? Something must have happened. Well, the theme of the day is resurrection. We just said something earlier that may sound corny to some of you, but it's life to us. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's why they were able to stay strong. And so when he's saying this in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Imagine. And so this voice is giving John a commission. Write down what you see in a book. And send it to the seven churches. Now, these are the seven churches that are in Asia Minor, but these are seven churches that are representative of all the churches that would come down through history. We're in this list. And so it's, you know, to the churches in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And so if you read later on in, in Revelation 2 and 3, you're going to see that there's a specific message for each of those churches. Read it on your own time. This is, it's amazing how, even though this was 2,000 years ago, they're still going through the same things we're going through right now. The Bible is ever relevant. I don't have to make the Bible relevant. It does just fine on its own. And so we're looking at this, and he's like, right. Write down what you see. And, well, that's not the first time that John was told this. In, in uh, 1 John 5, 13, he wrote, a, he wrote a battery of letters earlier that you'll see in the New Testament. And in 1 John 5, 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So when something is written down, the in intention was for it to be preserved, not just an oral tradition where it's like a telephone game and you start off saying, I want to go to Pizza Hut to buy a pizza, and then by the time you get to the end of the telephone game, you're, you know, you've taken a bath on Saturday in Jamaica. I mean, it just, the, the, it just completely shifts. So when you, you know, it's not just oral tradition. This is why God was asking his, his, his followers, write it down. Right? You may have seen Amadeus. There was a little scene that was in there when, when the guy's coming out and he commissions this thing from Mozart. He commissions something. Have you written it down? Nope. It's up here in my little noodle. Write it down, Mozart. Write it down. That's why. Because it's got to be preserved. And look at us now. We're in 2023 reading about this. I'm glad it was preserved for us. We need it. We need it. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, now we're getting into 12 to 16, and now we're getting into all of this imagery. But one of the free services we offer here at Arapahoe Road is trying to help you understand what in the world is being said in this book. So we get to here, and it says, then I turned to see the voice. I, I'm going to ask God about that. How do you see a voice? Huh? Huh? Right? Yeah. I turned to see the voice, but obviously there's an object where that voice is coming from. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. Well, let me, let me pump the brakes here. What's it talking about here? Well, later on in uh, Revelation 1.20, it says, and for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands and the seven stars that are in the, se the, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Seven is a number of completion. So what he's saying here is, is that Jesus, it looked like to John, right? Because sometimes when, when you're looking at things, you can ascertain what, how things are going by just taking a snapshot of something. And boy, you think you can put a whole narrative together. And we do this with people all the time. We're seeing somebody walking down the street, and all of a sudden we know their whole life, right? No, we don't. We think we do. We just take a snapshot and put a whole narrative to them. But that's what John was, was, was risking, is that he's looking and he's seeing everybody systematically executed. He's seeing everybody going through all of this, and he's losing hope. It doesn't look good. Oh, I don't know, I turn on the news and I struggle with that too. I hear conversations going on. I, I hear people who are talking about the brokenness and just the sadness that they have inside them and I'm like, my goodness, 
boy, this is where we are, aren't we? Boy, we need, we need to do something to give some hope into this world. So Jesus is standing in the middle of the seven lampstands. You know what that means? He's standing in the middle of the churches. What that means is, too, he's standing in the middle of his people. He hasn't left them. He's still there. He's still present. Again, we had clouds over the Rockies. Can't see the Rockies? Well, the Rockies must not be there, please. They're there. It's just the clouds are coming over and covering everything up but we know they're there. Right now, some clouds may have descended upon you and whatever's going on with you physically, financially, medically, educationally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, this and that and this and that, and some clouds may have descended. Oh, I can't see anything. Please know he's there. He's there on the other side of those clouds, and he is strengthening you in the midst of it. He's talking about one like a son of man. Well, that's that's kind of code for when, going back to Daniel. There's a passage in Daniel 7, 13, and 14. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven. There came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days. What a, what a title there, the ancient of days. Try to get your mind around that. And was present before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all the peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This was written 500 years before Jesus arrived on earth, but this is describing Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. And so this is the one that John is seeing. Now Jesus looks a little different to John now than he did when he saw him last. John was one, the only disciple that was there when Jesus was crucified. John saw him alive, as did the other disciples, which gave them strength and courage to be able to carry on. That's why they were willing to go to death. They saw that he was alive. He's different from all those other leaders. They die. He died, but he's now alive. And and this is one now where he's like a son of man. It says here that he's clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. Well, that means he's our great high priest. And what high priests do is mediate for us and intercede for us. I want to tell you something that is the most comforting thing, the most comforting doctrine, the most comforting truth that ministers to me is that Jesus Christ is in heaven praying for me. When you hear in the Bible that Jesus is interceding for you, that's just a fancy word of saying he's taking your prayers and he's bringing them to his Father and he's praying for you. He cares about you. He, he really does. It may not feel like it, but I, he does. And so he is ministering to us, and he is interceding for us, clothed with that long robe, those priestly robes. He's our great high priest. There, 1 Timothy 2, 5 says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Don't look at me as a mediator. I'm a lousy mediator. But I can point you to the one who is. I, I'm delivering the news. I'm delivering the mail on what he has given to us. But there's more to it. You see, you're you're going along and it's talking about the hairs of his head were white, white like wool. He didn't go to the store to try to cover that up. Or like some of us may do who try to, you know, take the blade off and take the guard off and get it all the way down. No, no, He, he, he wore that with pride. And the reason that he wore that, when I say pride, he wore that because that is showing his purity, the white, and he's eternal. He doesn't end. He is a king that will never abdicate his throne. In Hebrews 2.17, it says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people, and thus the purity enters in. It talks about his eyes are like a flame of fire. He sees everything. His, His eyes penetrate everything. And I know there was a time in my life where there were things that I was trying to hide from him. What a foolish errand that was because there's no way to be able to do it. His eyes are like a flame of fire that cuts through everything. Sometimes we're spending so much time trying to run from him thinking that if I run far enough away from him, he won't see what I'm doing or or this will happen under in privacy or in, in the cloak of night. He cuts through that too. He sees it all. And yet he's merciful enough to give you an opportunity to come back to him. He doesn't walk away from you when you disappoint him. No, he still keeps coming. He still keeps coming. He's the hound of heaven, the old theologians used to say. 
His eyes were like a flame of fire. And then he goes on to say that his, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. That's, again, another piece of the purity of Christ. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. I don't know about the first time you ever went to the ocean, but that can, if you're a little kid, that can be a terrifying experience. Because if you're in a, sit, a certain situation and that's all there is, is just that ocean, it's terrifying. Just imagine when a tsunami is coming on one of these islands and hearing that, the voice of the roar of many waters. And it wasn't like the Jewish folks were seafaring people anyway. They were land dwellers, so they didn't care for the sea at all. And so you're hearing this, but this is, this is the, the roar about when, when he speaks, and when you hear him, he shakes you. There's no way to be able to get away from it. In his right hand, he held the seven stars. Well, those are, the, those are the representing the churches. Boy, hey, if you're a follower of Jesus, you may feel like you're all over the place, but you know what that's saying right here? He's holding you right in the palm of his hand. You're his, and he's yours. And there's nothing that's going to change that reality in his hand. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. I'm trying to imagine this. It's like a magic trick, right? You know, when a magician gets up there, he gets a sword coming out. Well, this is more of, this is symbolic of the fact that when he speaks, the word of the Lord has been shown in various portions of Scripture as one that cuts. A double-edged sword cutting through bone and marrow. And, 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 it, and it pierces through everything, discerns the hearts and minds of men. And it's a judgment. When God speaks, when the Lord speaks, when he's sitting on his throne, then what he says and the, the sentence that comes out, that's what it is. This is what he is. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. He's the glory of God. In fact, Peter, James, and John saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. You can read about it in Matthew 17. Saw him on the Mount of Trans Transfiguration where Jesus went from being flesh and blood to all of a sudden they saw him in his true nature in his full glorious nature, and he came back. But now, that's how Jesus is now. See, every so often, that's what we got to be careful of. We see pictures of Jesus, and he, sometimes he looks mighty European. Um, he wasn't, but he looks mighty European. My grandmother had a, uh, a, a painting by Warner Salmon back in the 1860s and where Jesus just, I mean, he had this smooth skin, Blue eyes, long, flowing, brown, brown, blonde hair. Yeah, he looked really Middle Eastern. That's how he was born. He was born Middle Eastern. But somehow we like putting Jesus into our image. But we got to make sure that we are being conformed to what he's all about. See, if, if Jesus is alive, I keep doing that. I'm going to rephrase the sentence. Since Jesus is alive, since he's alive, everything has changed. You can't just blow him off. You can't take him or leave him now. If, if, since Jesus is alive, then everything that we're saying, we have a confidence in. The word, we, we have confidence in. We know this isn't just a, moral, a book of moral platitudes. This is infusing life into us because Jesus is alive. And so in verse 17 when it says, when I saw him, this is John now writing, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Century, any of you ever get century overload? No? Okay, just me? Great. Great. I'm the only one in the room. No, I'm sure you do. Um, but we got you know, to keep it together. Got to keep, keep everybody, you know, keep up those appearances. No, we, we, we get sensory overload. And if you have children running around the house, no matter how old they get, you know, and then you put a dog in the mix and a couple of cats and a bird, I'm just hypothetical, you know, you, you put all those things in the mix and then all of a sudden you're sitting there and I had luscious hair when I got here and now all of a sudden I don't, all of a sudden it's like, you know, swallows a capistrano, just, you know, we're, we're just going. No, but, but the thing, lemmings, that's what it is, that's what it, but be that as it may, you have the sensory overload and sometimes you just lock up. And, but here, he sees Jesus. He's like, I thought I knew Jesus. I remember Jesus. I don't remember him looking like that. But then it says that familiar hand. He laid his right hand on me. That's a familiar hand. And he says, fear not. Now, if I'm seeing this 
vision and, and reality of Jesus, and he's telling me not to be scared, there would be half of me that's like, have you, have you looked in the mirror? You're terrifying. But then on the other side, I'm like, okay, I know him. And I saw what he did for me. And I saw that he's now alive. And I've been giving my life to him ever since, even to the point of being stuck out on the middle of this rock, but I'm never going to deny him. Never, ever, ever am I going to deny him. I don't care what the consequences are. I'll stay out here until I rot. I'm never going to deny him because I saw him alive. But then he sees him in his present, current state. Fear not, he says. I am the first and the last. You know what that means? Over and over in the Old Testament, it's talked about that he's the first and the last. You may have heard the Alpha and the Omega. I don't know Greek. Well, Alpha, first letter, Omega, last letter. That means he was before everything that is, and he's going to be after everything that is. He's eternal. I'm the first and the last. He's calling himself Holy God. And after taking a look at what he said about here, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, you are. I am the last. I am the living one. I died. We don't like to talk about died. But he did. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Some of you, you may be here and you may, you may be a Jehovah's Witness. One thing I want to ask you is this. If he's the first and the last and that's God, how did God die? Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity. We are going to hold on to that as long as we can hold on to anything. Because it says, I, 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 the living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. If you trust in me, then you are going to be unlocked from the prison of death. You're going to be unlocked from the prison of your sin. You're going to be unlocked from the prison of your brokenness. You're free. And you know what Jesus said? If the Son sets you free, what is it? You might be free. We'll see how it goes. No, no, no. Yeah, you got it right. Correct me. Get me, get me straight. If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Not just free, free indeed. I mean, he, he, it is being locked in. And that's what redemption is all about. He sets us free. Verse 19, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. And we've already read verse 20 about what the, what the stars and the churches mean. So what, what's the point of all of this? The point of all of this is every Easter, there's a number of people that we want to talk to. So I'm going to talk to you just very quickly, those of you who are followers of Jesus. And you may be like John and you're wavering. You're losing a little bit of hope here. I, I know what you've said. I see that you're alive, but, my, but the eyeball test is not helping me right now. I need, and so here he's coming along and saying to you, I'm still on the throne. I'm still among your people. I'm alive. I was dead, but I'm alive, and I have the key to death and hell, and there's nothing that's going to change that. You're mine. I'm yours. I am still working out my plan. You just hang on. Those of you that may be here and you're not really sold on Christianity right now, you're wondering about it. You think it, 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 that works for you very nicely, and I'm glad it works for you. It's not working for me right now. I want you to see the Jesus that is sitting on the throne right now, and I want you to see all that he has accomplished for you. Even as you might shake your fist at him, he's like, I'm still coming after you. I'm still going to show you that I love you and that I care about you and that there are consequences for when you do something in my world that is not according to my plan. Well, I don't like a Jesus like that. Would you like police that did not enforce the law? Would you like judges that didn't enforce the law? You want it just to be a free-for-all? No, you want, those, you want those boundaries there, and that's all that God is, is saying in his world, boundaries. And those boundaries are there to provide for you and to protect you. When you get outside of those boundaries, you're not going to be provided for well, and you're not going to be protected, and it's to your destruction. 
And God has something way better for you, so much so that he was willing to send his own son to die for you so that you might be with him. Even after all that you've done, he says, I'm still willing to dispense mercy and grace upon you. I'm still willing to send my own son for you. That's love. That's love. And it's not love we deserve. That's grace. I just don't want you leaving out of here not knowing. I want you to see this Jesus. He's alive. And he came to live in us. And so when we sing these songs, we are singing it out of not just a tradition, so this is something we do. It is a joy. We get to sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. Ah, 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 ah. Le-e-lu-u-ya. It's so good. We got to sing that hallelujah, hallelujah, as long as we possibly can. Because, that, because what that means is praise God. Praise the Lord. So where are you this morning? We've, I know you've got Easter plans, and pretty soon we're going to let you be able to get to those, but God had Easter plans as well, and it, it involved his son on the cross in the empty tomb for you. So as you think about those plans, think about his plan, and just ask yourself, do I have that hope? Do I have that truth? Or am I trying to figure it out on my own? And man, I'm just running up against the wall over and over again. Doesn't that get frustrating? Doesn't that get old? Well, there's one who's there to make all things new. And he'll do it. There's a group, of, a, a room full of people that can testify to that. He'll make all things new. And oh, the air that you'll breathe and the freedom that you'll receive. We want that to be yours in Christ. Heavenly Father, guide us in all that we do and say. Use us, Lord, for your glory and for the good of those that are around us. And Lord, I know that um, as we observe Easter, it's a, it's a wonderful tradition. But may we look past the tradition and look to your son's crucifixion and resurrection. He's alive. And Lord, that makes us rejoice, but it also humbles us. Thank you for those that are here. And Lord, my words mean nothing but your word that's been taken by your spirit to change our hearts. Boy, what a great Easter morning that would be if our hearts and lives were strengthened in you and changed to you. Help us in the Lord in all that we do and say, guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. If you're not familiar with the way we go about things,